Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday as well on YouTube and you are not going to want to miss it. You guys are also going to want to subscribe because starting on the 24th of October, we are doing doing Halloween. And trust me, you guys, the cases that we have this year for Halloween are absolutely insane and ones that you are not going to want to miss. And if you don't know what Halloween is, Halloween is the one time of the year where we post back-to-back true crime episodes that are Halloween inspired. And we post these episodes from October 24th all the way through October 28th. This is a little killer instinct tradition that we do here. I believe this is the fourth time that we've done Halloween, and it just gets crazier and crazier every year. As you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the murder of Tammy Jo Blanton. This is a brutally horrific murder and one that is incredibly frustrating because it was so easily preventable. This case is one of the more gruesome cases that we have done in a long time. It is a solved case and it is one that involves cannibalism. And I always like to give that disclaimer because I do know that people have sensitive stomachs and some people don't want to hear about that. So this case does involve cannibalism. And if that's not something that you can stomach, no worries. I'll see you next week. But if you're ready, let's just jump right on into it today. Tammy Jo Blanton was born on January 7th, 1968 in Indiana to her parents, Daryl and Linda. Tammy grew up being one of four children and being the only girl in the family as she had three brothers. Her brothers were Tim, Darren, and Jason. Now, sadly, her brother Darren passed away as well prior to her own death. So her parents had to live through the death of two children, which is something that no parent should ever have to experience. Tammy grew up in the town of Jeffersonville, Indiana, and graduated from Jeffersonville High School in 1986. After graduating high school, she remained in Jeffersonville, where she eventually ended up getting a job in coding and billing at a company called Zermed. Zermed is an online software that assists in health and medical needs. Now, Tammy was described as an independent, free spirit. She didn't have any children of her own, so she was really given that freedom of being able to do what she wanted when she wanted. She was extremely close to her family. Her brothers had children of their own, and she was the cool aunt. Tammy also was a very compassionate person. She always saw the good in everyone and wanted to help everyone however she was able to. She's described as having a kind-hearted nature. So this case starts in the spring of 2014, and that is when Tammy would meet a new love interest in her life. Tammy ended up meeting a man named Joseph Oberhansley. Now, Joseph is also an Indiana native. However, he moved throughout the state in and out of it all throughout his life. Now, when the two of them met, Tammy was 46 years old and Joseph was 38 years old. And I think it's fair to say that most people, typically everyone, especially when you get a little older, everyone has a backstory. And Joseph was definitely the one that had a few more extra pieces of luggage when it came to entering this relationship with Tammy. Joseph was born on March 29th, 1981 to his father, Stephen, and his mother, Brenda. He was one of three children and was also the middle child. He had a half brother named Justin, who was six years older than him, as well as a younger sister. Now, growing up, his family said that Joseph was very loving. He did not have a violent nature and he was raised in a very calm and loving household. And according to Joseph's family, Joseph had several life-changing and life-altering events that happened to him that changed him from being that loving and caring boy that they had raised to a very different version of himself. And one of those events would be the passing of Joseph's brother. On June 1st, 1997, Joseph's brother, Justin, had committed suicide. Now, as you can imagine, this broke 
Joseph completely. It took a giant toll on him. And because of it, he ended up turning to drugs to help cope with the pain that he was experiencing. So his brother passed away in June 1997. And then just one month later, in July of 1997, Joseph's father also ended up passing away from what was said to be a suspicious overdose. So there was a lot of questions revolving around Joseph's father's death. However, to have those two monumental losses back to back, it severely affected Joseph. And I don't think that anyone could sit here and say that it would be expected for that not to affect someone in any way. After these two major losses, Joseph felt as if his mental health was completely deteriorating. He felt like his life was going in a downward spiral and really did not see the point to life anymore. However, that is when he met a girl named Sabrina Elder. Now, Sabrina and Joseph were the same age at this time. They were both 17 years old. And because of his drug use, Sabrina's family was adamant on the fact that they did not want her to date Joseph. Sabrina's grandfather actually recalls the first time that he met Joseph and said that he had to chase him off of the lawn just for the simple fact that he did not want him dating his granddaughter. However, ultimately, all of her family's attempts had failed and Sabrina became pregnant in early 1998. However, shortly after they found out about this pregnancy, Sabrina and Joseph decided that it was in the best interest of their relationship to end things romantically. But despite not being romantically together anymore, Sabrina still decided to move in with Joseph at Joseph's grandmother's house because what could possibly go wrong? So under this one roof, you had Sabrina, Joseph, Joseph's grandmother, their mother, Brenda, as well as the younger sister. So that is five people under one roof and not including the baby on the way. The baby was born on December 4th of 1998 and Sabrina was thrilled that she now had a son whom she'd actually named Joseph. And you would think that the father, Joseph, would be equally as thrilled. This is supposed to be the most amazing time in his life. However, he was not as happy as you would think. Joseph had complained to multiple friends of his that he had concerns and doubts regarding his son's paternity. He also complained a lot about the fact that Sabrina was living with him and they were all living together and even made remarks about killing her. So this brings us to December 9th of 1998. So just five days after the baby was born. On this day, Joseph arrived home at his grandmother's house where his grandma, mom, sister, and Sabrina and the baby were all hanging out together in the living room. So everyone was gathered in the living room, spending time together, bonding with the baby, and Joseph walked into the house and immediately his family could tell that something was off. He began pacing back and forth up and down the hallways before ultimately he pulled out a gun and began shooting. His mother, Brenda, immediately by instinct grabbed the baby and started running to try and put the baby somewhere safe. However, when that happened, Joseph pointed the gun at his own mother and shot her in the back. Once Brenda hit the floor, Joseph's 13-year-old sister grabbed the baby and was able to get to safety. However, during that time, Joseph then turned the gun on Sabrina and shot her in the head five times. Now, after shooting Sabrina and ultimately killing her, he then turned the gun on himself and shot himself underneath the chin in an attempt to end his life. Now, unfortunately, Sabrina did succumb to her injuries and passed away, and she was only 17 years old with a five-day-old baby. Now, luckily, Brenda, who was shot in the back, was able to survive and heal from her injuries, and the grandma, younger sister, and the baby were all unharmed. Now, as far as Joseph himself, he was rushed to the hospital and he actually survived his own suicide attempt, which I highly doubt he was expecting. When he healed, he faced murder charges for the death of Sabrina, as well as attempted murder for the shooting of his mother. So Joseph was arrested for murder in January of 1999, and his bail was originally set at $1 million dollars and the defense attorney actually tried to convince the judge to reduce that bail to only five thousand dollars 
But luckily, the judge saw right through that and decided against that. Now, Joseph's family, despite everything, was now sticking by his side through thick and thin, and his grandparents were even paying for his defense attorneys. And these had to have been some very, very talented defense attorneys because what ended up happening was Joseph was actually released without any bail. However, he was placed on house arrest. And Joseph's family was thrilled to finally have him home. They knew that obviously Joseph was struggling with some things mentally and wanted to help guide him through that, but they thought the best way that he could get through those things was with his family and at home. Now, in terms of what happened to the baby, I was not able to figure that out. That wasn't public information. I'm not sure if the baby was placed with Sabrina's family. I did see one article alluding to that. However, there's never been anything that I could find that was confirmed. So all of Joseph's family was preparing to have to testify at his trial. His mom, his sister, his grandma, they were all testifying in his pre-trial hearings. So they were assuming that they were going to have to testify again in his official trial. However, an official trial never happened. In January of the year 2000, Joseph ended up pleading guilty to manslaughter for killing Sabrina and attempted murder of Brenda, his mother. Joseph's defense attorney said, quote, this was not an intentional act. All of the stressors involved in Joseph's life at the time led up to this. It is likely that outside of all of those factors, this never would have happened. The injury he sustained actually had a beneficial effect because of the portion of the brain that was injured, end quote. So let me explain what he's saying here. So essentially, what this defense attorney is claiming is not only was this not an intentional act, which pulling out a gun and shooting someone five times in the head, seem, it seems pretty intentional. But despite that fact in and of itself, the defense attorney is actually arguing the fact that where Joseph shot himself in his head, the nerve that was hit caused him now to not be as emotionally distressed. He was more calm, he was more relaxed, he didn't have you know, anger issues or anything like that because where he shot himself was able to readjust that nerve and almost restabilize it. Which by the way, there was never anything to prove that that was the case. So in March of the year 2000, Joseph was sentenced to 15 years in prison for the manslaughter charge and another 15 years for the attempted murder charge. Now, Sabrina's family, as you can imagine, were absolutely floored and livid that Joseph got off on manslaughter. Her grandfather actually said, quote, he's going to get out in five to seven years and he's going to do it again, end quote. That was his prediction. So fast forward 12 years later, in July of 2012, and the parole board gathered to determine the fate of Joseph. And during his hearing, Brenda, his mother, was there and was an advocate for Joseph to be released and claimed that the drugs that he was on at the time were the reasoning for his behavior. Like I mentioned earlier, after the passing of Joseph's father and his brother, he did turn to drugs. So Brenda is now saying that the drugs were the cause of the behavior. However, Sabrina's family was also at this hearing and they were obviously advocating for Joseph to remain in prison and at least serve out his 15 year sentence for the manslaughter charge. Now again, in prison, Joseph had argued that where the bullet hit him in his brain had actually caused him to restabilize and level out and become a more calm person, which again was never confirmed by any sort of doctor or neurologist or anything like that. However, Joseph was ultimately released. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Now you guys know that it can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's truly no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or how small. Now, you guys know that I've been an advocate for therapy and for better help for the longest time. And along with that, just being an advocate for getting help when you feel like you need it. And I love the fact that better help is online therapy all from the comfort of your own 
home. It really provides a more comfortable experience all around. So if you're thinking about trying out therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional cost. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash instinct today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash instinct. I've said it before and I will say it again. If you are a small business owner, you know how important it is to be ready for the insane holiday season. And if you haven't started preparing for the chaos of holiday mailing and shipping, it's easy to feel like you're already starting to fall behind. But don't worry because stamps.com has everything you need to make your life a whole lot easier. It's the 24 seven post office that you can access from anywhere. No lines, no traffic, no hassle. Stamps.com is your one-stop shop for all your shipping and mailing needs. For more than 20 years, stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. They're the stress-free solution for every small business. You can use stamps.com to print postage wherever you do your business. All you need is a computer and a printer. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through the stamps.com dashboard. Rates are constantly changing, but with stamps.com's switch and save feature, you can easily compare carriers and rates so you know you're getting the best deal every time. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Get started with stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code KILLER. So after his release from prison, Joseph moved to southern Indiana, and it did not take him long when he got there to get back into trouble. In March of 2013, Joseph got into a fight, but this was not your typical fight. Joseph had met a woman at a bar, and this woman had brought Joseph back to her apartment, and the two of them began to have sex. Now what Joseph either did or did not know was that this woman that he was with actually had a boyfriend. So during their encounter, the woman's boyfriend ended up coming home, seeing his girlfriend with Joseph and apparently freaked out. He grabbed a baseball bat and hit Joseph over the head with it. And that is when Joseph retaliated and tried to strangle the boyfriend. Now, Joseph was taken to Clark County Jail over this and was charged with aggravated battery, strangulation, and resisting law enforcement. Now, this should have been a cause for his parole to be violated and revoked and for him to be sent back to prison. However, the parole board was never made aware of this incident for whatever reason. Somehow it slipped underneath them. And so Joseph was just let off free. Technically, it wasn't free because Joseph's grandfather bailed him out on a $1,000 bond. However, again, he was just able to walk as a free man after that. So now let's get back to Tammy and Joseph, now that you have this backstory on Joseph. And you might be sitting there wondering, why would Tammy get into a relationship with this man knowing his past? Did she know his past? And that's something we really don't have an answer to. Tammy did know that Joseph had been in and out of prison. However, it's unclear if she knew the exact reason why. We do know that she was aware of the drug-related charges and the charges related to the fight, but again, the manslaughter and attempted murder, we don't know if she was aware of that. But despite all that, when Tammy met Joseph, the compassion in her just started leaking out. Tammy wanted to help Joseph. She wanted to put him on the right path. She saw an abundance of potential in him and really wanted to help him however she could. And like I mentioned earlier, that was just the type of person that Tammy was. And Tammy had a lot of fun with Joseph. The two of them would go to bars together. They would go on date nights, hang out at home. Tammy was really smitten with Joseph. Now, even though Tammy's friends and family were really happy for Tammy and the fact that she was dating someone and she was seemingly very happy, there were some red flags that appeared just a few weeks into the relationship that caused friends and family to worry. People who knew the couple said that Tammy would vent to her friends about how controlling Joseph was. And her friends could tell that Joseph was trying to isolate Tammy from the people who cared about her. 
However, the relationship continued on. Even though they started dating in mid-spring 2014, the two ended up moving in together just a couple weeks later in June 2014. And at first, Tammy was really excited about it. Joseph had moved into her house, so even though it was originally her space, she was excited to share it with Joseph and start this new chapter together. Despite the speed of their relationship, she viewed it as a whirlwind romance. However, that whirlwind soon came crashing down. On July 21st, 2014, Joseph had gotten in trouble with the law again after he had led police on a high-speed chase starting in Jeffersonville, Indiana and ending all the way in Kentucky. He was charged on July 23rd with criminal recklessness and resisting arrest. However, he was never sent to prison for this. And when Tammy found out about this, she was incredibly frustrated. She felt like she had been putting in so much work and effort to try and get Joseph to be put on the right path and try and veer him away from this life of crime. However, he kept making choices again and again that got him in trouble with the law. But their relationship really didn't start to deteriorate until September of 2014. And this is where the jealousy and controlling behavior from Joseph really reached its peak. And the breaking point was the weekend of September 5th of 2014. During the weekend of September 5th, Tammy had claimed that Joseph had repeatedly raped her. She walked into work on September 8th and confided in her co-workers about what had happened that weekend. And she told her co-workers that she was done with Joseph and that she was going to end the relationship. When her co-workers had asked her if she was going to press charges against Joseph, Tammy said that she wasn't going to because she didn't want Joseph to go back to prison. She just wanted the relationship to be over with and wanted Joseph out of her life. So that night after work, Tammy ended up going home and broke up with Joseph. She told him to pack his belongings and leave as it was her house in the beginning. And as you can imagine, Joseph was very unhappy with this. He did everything in his power to try and convince Tammy to not end the relationship, and he started getting very angry. So much so that Tammy decided that she was going to stay with a friend that night on September 8th. That way, it would give Joseph the night to clear out his belongings and also would just give them the separation that she wanted. The following day while Tammy was at work, Joseph showed up to her office and tried to speak to her, however, was sent away. He then showed up at her house later that night, however, Tammy had luckily already changed the locks by that point, so he was not able to get inside. Now, Tammy thought that this was just an initial shock of a breakup. She really thought that Joseph was just going to leave her alone after a certain point. However, that was not the case. On September 11th, 2014, in the early morning hours at 3 a.m., Tammy called 911 after noticing that Joseph was trying to break into her home. Police arrived immediately and confronted Joseph and asked him to leave, and Joseph got extremely aggravated. He was agitated, he was yelling at them, and he was telling police that they always side with women. However, ultimately, Joseph agreed to leave. Now, after Joseph ultimately left Tammy's house by police instruction, authorities ended up patrolling Tammy's house for the following hour just to make sure that the coast was clear and Joseph was really gone, which ultimately it looked like he was and police had left. Now that morning, Tammy obviously was scheduled to go into work and her friends started to get a little worried when she did not show up for her shift. Tammy was a very responsible person. She was a very punctual person. She was not one that was late for work. She was not one that skipped work. And even if she was going to be late for work, she would always call someone and let them know. She had become very close friends with a lot of the coworkers in her office, and there was no way she wasn't going to just shoot one of them a text to let them know what was going on. Now, because her coworkers knew about the situation with Joseph, they did become pretty worried very quickly. Her coworker, Teresa, decided to call Tammy's phone, and that is when a man answered. Now, this man claimed to be Tammy's brother. Now, this might have been believable if Teresa did not know what Joseph's voice sounded like. 
because she was able to identify that he was the one on the other end of the call. Teresa immediately hung up the phone and decided to call one of Tammy's close friends who advised them to then call the police. 911 was called and a request for a welfare check was done on Tammy. And at this point, it was still in the morning hours. However, there were different officers on duty than the ones that had originally arrived at Tammy's home in the early morning hours around 3 a.m. when she made that first call. So these new officers were not aware of what had happened earlier. And because it was so early in the morning when this occurred, Tammy didn't tell any of her friends about it. It was three or four in the morning, so no one was awake. So it was only those initial officers that knew. Now, when these new officers arrived on the scene and started looking around, they noticed that Tammy's back door showed signs of forced entry. Police knocked on the door, and that is when Joseph answered. Police had asked him where Tammy was and if they could speak with her. However, Joseph told authorities that he didn't know where Tammy was, but she wasn't at this house. Now, obviously police found this to be pretty suspicious considering this was Tammy's house and her car was there and it just didn't seem like she wouldn't be there. Now, along with that, police looked down at Joseph's hands while they were talking to him and noticed that there was blood on his hands. Police instructed Joseph to walk out of the house and wait in the front yard with a few officers while the remainder of the police walked inside of the house. They started searching around and the first thing they noticed was that there was blood everywhere, all over the house, in the hallways, in the kitchen, on the walls. It was a bloodbath. Now, police were trying to make out where this blood was coming from, and that is when it led them to the bathroom. They noticed that the bathroom door had appeared to be kicked in, and inside of the bathroom, they found a bloody tarp covering the bathtub, and what they found underneath was horrifying. All right, now I have a question for you guys. What is the first thing that you do when you wake up? Is it checking your credit score? Yeah, no, I didn't think so. But at Chime, that is exactly what they do. With their secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start to build credit with your own money. Chime reports your payments to credit bureaus to help you build credit over time. Their members see an increase of 30 points on average. All of this with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. So start your credit journey with Chime. Sign up only takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com slash killer. That's chime.com slash killer. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank NA pursuant to a license from Visa USA. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact your score may vary, and some users' scores may not improve. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply except at MoneyPass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance. ATMs. If you're sitting here hearing this ad right now, it means one thing. It means that you're alive. And what that means is that you still have time to get life insurance with Ethos. With Ethos, you could get life insurance in 10 minutes for as little as $10 a month. Unlike other companies' long, confusing, and outdated application process, Ethos 100% online application only takes minutes so you can get back to living. Ethos has no medical exams, just a few easy health questions, and competitive rates from top-rated carriers. Ethos is affordable and convenient. Convenient. I've always been so daunted by the idea of life insurance, you guys. I don't know about you, but it's always been one of those things where I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where to get it. I don't know who to get it from. But Ethos has made the process so incredibly easy and seamless, and it takes the pressure off of everything. And you guys can join the thousands of satisfied families protected with help from Ethos who have given the company a 4.8 star rating on Google reviews. Every year you wait, life insurance premiums increase by 8 to 10%. Get a free personalized quote at ethoslife.com slash killer spelled e-t-h-o-s life.com slash killer go to ethoslife.com slash killer to get your free life insurance quote today ethos technologies inc operates in california as ethos life insurance services not available in all states and prices subject to underwriting and certain health questions 
Underneath the tarp, police had found the body of Tammy Blanton, who had been brutally and viciously attacked. Tammy had multiple large and deep cut wounds on her face, head, neck, and chest. Her neck was slashed and the front of her skull was completely crushed. Her head was so badly and intentionally cut open that a piece of her skull and brain were missing, as well as there was brain tissue in the bathtub. The lacerations on her chest were equally as brutal, revealing her internal organs and part of her heart and lung tissue were removed from her body as well. Now you may be wondering where those missing pieces of her brain, skull, heart and lungs were, because that is what police were wondering too. However, it did not take them long to figure out that they were in Tammy's kitchen. A portion of her skull was found on a plate and there was also a skillet on the stove with a pair of kitchen tongs that all contained blood on them as well. Due to this evidence, police theorized that Joseph had actually eaten the missing organs of Tammy's. So not only did he brutally and savagely kill her, he ate her as well. Now, Joseph was immediately arrested and taken into police custody, and he initially denied having any involvement in what happened to Tammy, but police knew that he was absolutely full of it, and it was a matter of time until he confessed, which fortunately did not take very long. Joseph told authorities that after being told to go away by cops earlier that morning, he returned back to Tammy's house several hours later, but this time he parked down the street so Tammy wouldn't know that he was there. He said he broke into the home and when Tammy realized what was going on, she ran into the bathroom to hide from Joseph. However, he ran after her and broke down the bathroom door. He then admitted to attacking and stabbing her with a knife before using a saw to cut open her skull. And not only that, Joseph confirmed police's suspicions when he admitted that he had eaten different body parts of Tammy's. He initially admitted to eating her raw brain first, however decided to cook the rest of it. He also confessed to eating her heart and part of her lungs. Joseph was officially charged with murder on September 16th, 2014, and held without bond. Now, after Joseph confessed, he actually tried to recant his statement and said that he gave his confession out of police coercion. So this case ended up having to go to trial. And when it came to the trial, Joseph's defense team initially wanted to plead insanity. However, Joseph argued against that which ultimately led the defense team with no choice but to withdraw themselves from Joseph's legal team. Now, despite Joseph fighting against it, there were several instances leading up to the trial where he was deemed unfit to stand trial. In 2017, so three years after the murders, Joseph was found unfit and was sent to the Logansport State Hospital to be evaluated. Joseph was evaluated by three different psychiatrists who all concluded that he was not competent to stand trial. Now, because of that, he was kept in the hospital and not released, but treated for one year before he was deemed fit to stand trial in 2018. So now we're four years past the murder. Now, even in 2018, his defense again wanted him to plead insanity, but again, he was against it. And at this point, he had already been evaluated and deemed fit to stand trial at this point. So the defense and the prosecution came to an agreement. And the agreement was that the prosecution would not try and go for the death penalty if the defense did not try and plead insanity. So this trial began in 2019 and several of Tammy's friends had testified to the abuse that Tammy had endured by Joseph. Now, one friend in particular had brought up the fact that Tammy did not want to press charges when Joseph had raped her because she didn't want to send Joseph back to prison and also brought up the fact that Joseph had been in prison for prior charges. Now, these statements ended up being considered improper evidence because Joseph's prior criminal record was not allowed to be presented as evidence because they didn't want the jury to have that information. So the judge actually declared a mistrial because of that. 
And it is just unfathomable what Tammy's family had to be going through at this point. All they wanted was justice for her, and it seemed like this trial was never ending. And that brings us to six years after her murder on September 11th, 2020, when there was a second trial. Now, during this trial, jurors were shown all the evidence they needed to know that Joseph had been the one to murder Tammy. Prosecution presented its evidence that showed that Tammy's DNA was found on the dishes, cookware, and knives. It also showed that Tammy's DNA was found on Joseph's hands. Now, text messages between Tammy and Joseph were also released, and one message in particular was in regards to what happened the weekend of September 5th. Tammy texted Joseph, quote, You can choose to be in denial about what happened Saturday into Sunday. I won't be in denial. No one, and I mean no one, gets to terrify me like you did on Sunday. I will never forget that as long as I live. I don't want to invoke police, but if you leave me no choice, that is what I will have to do. At the end of the day, I'm taking my life back. I worked too hard to get here. No one will take me down. End quote. Now, the defense had actually only called Joseph to testify on the stand, and he claimed that his confession was completely just because police had coerced him and that he was not responsible for Tammy's death. He actually told this story about how when he returned to Tammy's house the second time that he had seen Tammy with quote unquote two black guys. And so when he saw this, he just ended up leaving. Now, luckily, this jury did not buy that story for a single second. And after a five day trial and just a few hours of deliberation, the jury found Joseph guilty of first degree murder and burglary. And on October 13th, 2020, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So that is the case of Tammy Jo Blanton. So not only was she viciously and savagely and brutally murdered, but the person that she once loved and welcomed into her home and tried to help with everything that she could consumed her organs as well. And what's so frustrating about this case, like I said in the beginning, is how preventable it was. The fact that Joseph got let out on good behavior after he killed Sabrina, it seems so ironic that someone who viciously murdered someone would then get out on good behavior. And maybe that's a hot take. I don't really know. You guys can let me know what you think about that. Now, this case is very similar to one of the cases that we're covering in Hollow Week. And the reason for that is because, again, so preventable. And not saying that all cases aren't preventable because none of these cases should ever have to happen to begin with. However, to think about the fact that this person had already shown their true colors once before, and you're going to give them the ability to be released on good behavior, and we're just going to watch them do it again. Sabrina's grandfather called it from the beginning that he was going to do this again. Shooting someone in the head five times, that is a very intentional act. And so to hear that his defense attorney in the very beginning claimed that this was not intentional, that's very hard to believe. Obviously, you have to factor in mental stability and all of those things. However, to say it wasn't intentional is not a valid argument. And clearly the defense and Joseph both saying that the way that the bullet hit him had calmed him down and made him a more stabilized person, obviously was just BS from the beginning. But that you guys is the case of Tammy Jo Blanton. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Again, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you're not gonna wanna miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new case for you guys and until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye guys.